All right, good afternoon. Um, as you all know, it's, the weather is horrible outside. It's bitterly cold, um, so class um, is canceled tomorrow. Uh, but I still want to do the lecture, so I'm going to do that over a video today just so we don't fall um, behind. So I'm recording right now for this January 30th lecture. And just so you don't forget about doing this video, I suggest you just watch it um, at the regular time. You've already carved that um, out in your schedule. Uh, last lecture, we talked a lot about a lot of the general concepts in programming without actually looking at any Python code. We kind of learned all the concepts without getting into the details. <clears throat> this lecture is the opposite. Uh, we're going to be diving into all a lot of the nitty-gritty details of writing Python code, and there's going to be a lot of lectures like this um, coming up. So uh, a few things here. You can see that Project 1 is due today. Uh, if you haven't started that, you should get on it now. It's, it's not hard, but... Um, you don't want to do that one late and use up your late days. Uh, you also see here that there's a reading associated with today. Um, so this is uh, the Downey book. That's Think Python Chapter 1. Um, if you come to Resources and you go to uh, Readings, um, you can see that here's a link to Think Python by Alan Downey. So that's the Downey book you can draw here. And then there's a PDF right here. And you should read Chapter 1 of this, this book at some point. Um, the other thing that I did today is I created this worksheet, and I recommend you, um, you know, pause the video and print this out before I, I, I continue. And there's a bunch of questions here, different things that you should be learning as I'm going through this lecture, and I suggest you kind of skim over those, and whenever you see an answer to one of these questions, just fill it out. For example, we're going to learn how to multiply numbers today in Python, and you should um, note that down, and this will just help you be a little bit more engaged. And then on the second page, we have a bunch of practice problems and depending on how long this video is drawing, maybe we'll do a few of these today. Okay, so let me head over to uh, the lecture. Um, so we're going to learn a little bit about programming today. Uh, we're going to learn how to run Python. Uh, there's many ways to run Python. One of them is in something called Jupyter Notebook, which we've already used in, in Project 1 a little bit, hopefully, but I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that. Uh, we're going to learn about these things called operators. Um, you've seen mathematical operators before, like plus, minus, and so on. Uh, we're going to learn about some other operators that maybe you haven't seen before. Uh, for example, we're going to learn how to do comparisons and uh, logical operators, which might be new to a lot of you. Um, finally, we're going to learn about a bunch of different types of data that you can have in uh, your Python programs. Okay, so let's talk about different, some different terminology and different ways we're going to be running Python. Um, what you're going to need to get on your computer are, are a few things. Um, you need to install Python 3 if you haven't already. And along with Python 3, uh, we're going to need some extra packages like Jupyter and something called Matplotlib. And you're going to install those with a tool called PIP. I've already shown how to do that in a video. Um, you're going to need some sort of program that lets you edit Python code or write a, a Python code. Um, kind of a simple, easy one to use is called idle. Uh, and that might be the simplest for you because it already comes pre-installed uh, with Python. And then finally, you need to use this new Jupyter Notebooks thing, uh, which we have already installed with PEP. So here, here's a new word for you, interpreter. Um, interpreter is a program that runs another uh, program for you. Um, why do we need an interpreter? Well, computers, you know, at, at the end of the day, they're all speaking in ones and zeros. Right? And I, as a programmer, even though I really, don't like, I really like programming, I don't want to spend my time writing ones and zeros and thinking at that level. So what I want to do is I want to write code that's kind of easy to understand in, in a language called Python, and then let an interpreter translate the code that I like to write uh, into something that the machine uh, likes to work with. Um, let, let me make a comparison here. Uh, in the last lecture, we were doing all these worksheet problems. And maybe the worksheet said something like, put 11 uh, in the box. Uh, in this situation, your brain processed that command, and then you translated that into some actions that were very detailed and very specific. For example, your brain told your hand, put the pen down on the paper, and then move your hand down. Lift your hand, move your hand up and to the right, put the pen down again, and then move it down. So you ultimately wrote 11. Um, in this case, your brain is an interpreter. It's uh, uh, converting this kind of abstract, easy to understand, put 11 in the box, into a bunch of detailed uh, motions. And it's going to be very similar uh, with an interpreter for Python. We're going to write our Python code, which I have in the bottom left here, 
And even though you might not know what that means yet, you can see it's not that complicated. I can see that maybe I'm printing out, hello, Tyler. Okay, so that's going to go into a program called the Python interpreter. And then the Python interpreter is going to convert that into something uh, that the machine knows how to deal with, uh, namely commands that are, are basically represented as zeros and ones. Okay, so we have these interpreters here. Um, the weird thing about this is that the Python interpreter itself is a program and the input to it is a program that we wrote. So we really have a program that's running a program here, but you know, this will become uh, very familiar to you after you do this a bunch of times. Okay, so that was an interpreter. Another piece of software I need is an editor, and that's just a program for typing uh, code. And uh, w what's great about Python code is it's, it's something that we might call just a plain text file, which means we could open up the same Python code in a lot of different uh, programs. For an example, uh, I have two programs here on my Mac, idle and text edit, and you can see I opened up the same program in, in both those files. Now, if you look carefully, you might see that on the left, I have different colors. I have some orange and purple and green, and on the right, it's all, all black. This is not part of my code itself. Uh, different editors, such as idle, um, will add color for you after you open your file, uh, just to make it a little bit easier to read. Um, but ultimately, maybe somebody else will open up that same file and different things will be different colors. Um, this is all a matter of personal preference. It's not in the file itself. It's all it has to do with the editor. The third thing we're going to use are, are Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, you can think of Jupyter Notebooks as, as a platform where you can run Python. And so just creating one big file, we're going to be able to break our work up into a bunch of chunks uh, called cells. And in each cell, we're going to write a little bit of Python code. And what's great about Jupyter Notebooks is it allows us to interleave our code with other things. So in the same document, we're going to have a mix of Python code, maybe some plots, some tables, uh, maybe you'll write some documentation, uh, paste some images. You can do a lot of different things. And when you save one of these notebooks, you're going to get a file that has the extension .i, pi, and b, interactive Python notebook. And, and this is fundamentally different than just a simple .py file that you might open in an editor. Uh, if you're creating one of these, you're going to have to uh, use, open it up in Jupyter Notebooks again or use some other special tool. Um, in contrast with editors, you can kind of share these .py files across different editors. Okay, so we're, there's three ways we're going to be running Python uh, this semester. And uh, you can see here in this first example, which is called interactive mode, I was at a bash prompt, right? So I just open up the terminal, I'm in this prompt, I type Python and I hit enter. And then you see a little farther down, I have these three red arrows. Um, that's another prompt, and what that means is Python is waiting for me to type code, and every line of code I type is just trying to run it immediately. <clears throat> this is called interactive mode because each time I type just a little bit of code, it immediately does it. It's not waiting until um, I'm all done. Now, the other mode we're going to use is script mode. In this case, again, I start in the red, which is that um, bash prompt. I'm going to type Python again. That's the name of the interpreter program. And I'm going to give it an argument. And that argument is the name of uh, my Python code file. In this case, it's called myprogram.py. So the first, first thing I type is the name of the Python interpreter, which is just Python, and then the name of that program. And when I run that, it'll run the whole program uh, to completion. It's not going to go one line at a time like it is in interactive mode. Then finally, uh, we can open up, um, I'm going to call it notebook mode, even though that, just to be consistent, even though most people wouldn't call it that. Uh, we can type Jupyter Notebook, and then it's going to open up Jupyter in a web browser. And that's how we're going to do most of our work this semester, although I'm going to give examples of all three of these. So let me start uh, with a few demos here. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to see what these three different modes look like. So I'm going to open up first my terminal. I'm going to go to Applications, and then I'm going to go down to uh, Utilities, and then I'm going to open up the terminal, right? And so the terminal on Mac by default is running the bash shell, right? So this is where I may be typing uh, commands. Uh, what you might want to do, since you're going to be using this a lot during the semester, is you might go down here in the dock, right click, and you can say, <coughs> check this box here that I have, keep in dock. In the future, you can just click down here. If I want more than one window open, maybe I'll right click on this and, and say new window. Um, but for now, this one window is just fine. 
Okay, so I'm gonna enter interactive mode. And remember that for inter interactive mode, all I do is I type um, uh, the name of the Python interpreter program, which is just Python, and I hit enter. Okay, so we see I'm at a prompt again. Originally I was at a prompt, a bash prompt, where I had type Python. Now I see Python is running and uh, I'm inside a Python prompt. So I can do things like, you know, one plus one, two plus two, um, lots of different code I could write here. Um, what sometimes throws people off when they're first seeing this is they imagine that they can still type regular terminal commands and you cannot. So for example, if I type ls, that would not work. If I type pwd, that wouldn't work. ls and pd are examples of bash commands, not Python code. So what if I wanna stop being in Python interactive mode and go back to bash? Um, if you're on um, a Mac, you can just press control D, D is in dog. Uh, if you're on a Windows computer, you could press control Z and then hit enter. Um, or sometimes you can just type exit with parentheses like that. So now that I'm back here, I'm gonna try running these commands again, ls and pwd. So we're in ls, that works fine. pwd, that works fine. Because I'm in bash mode, right? This is my bash prompt. But now I can't run Python code. Remember before I ran one plus one and two plus two. Uh, these things, although they work in PowerShell, <coughs> do not work um, in a bash prompt. So I might run that and I get some sort of error. So I can go back and forth between these worlds. I'm going to say Python again. Now one plus one works. LS does not. If I hit Control D to exit, now I can type LS again, but I can't do one plus one. So just always look at what prompt. If it looks like this, you're in Python prompt. If it's like this or, or something else similar, um, you're in a bash prompt. Okay, so that's one way we can run Python code. Well, let me show you another example. I'm gonna say idle. So remember when I just type one word like that, that's the name of a program. And so this is gonna open up the idle program, which is an editor. So let me do this. Uh, this comes with Python, so you should have it on your computer. Then you go to file, a new file. And uh, let, me, let me just save this right away. I'm gonna save as and I need to find a nice place for it. So I'm gonna expand this. And I'm gonna to go to Documents, CS301. <coughs> and maybe I'm just gonna make a directory here. Uh, I'll say Lecture 4 uh, for all the examples I'm doing today. And I'm gonna name this file main.py. Now at this point, you might want to pause the video until you catch up to this point so you can follow along on your own computer and do all these examples yourself. So I'm going to save this here. It's currently just an empty file. And I'm going to try what I did just before. I'm going to say 1 plus 1 and 2 plus 2. This was code I ran in my um, interactive mode before. And then I'm going to come up to run. And uh, what I do is I want to do run module. And I actually see there's a keyboard shortcut, F5. So I'm going to press F5. <coughs> And before I can run it, I have to save my code, so I'll, I'll save it. And it ran over in this window. Um, but it's a little bit funny. I was expecting two and four, uh, but I didn't get any output over here. And, and that's because uh, this mode that I'm in now, which is script mode, right, where I'm actually running a complete Python program, doesn't automatically print things out for me. When I'm in interactive mode, everything gets automatically printed. So when I'm in strip mode, what I'm going to have to do is when I want to print off a value like this, I have to use the word print, and then I have to put that value in parentheses, right? So I'm going to say print and, and put that same thing in parentheses. And now I'm going to hit F5 again. It's going to ask me to save. And this time I actually get my two values. I have two, which is one plus one, and four, which is two plus two. Okay, so we've seen two ways now that we can run Python code, either interactive mode or script mode. I'm gonna close out of this, maybe after saving it, and, and show you the third way. Okay, so I'm gonna close this, I'm gonna close this. Okay, so now I wanna open up Jupyter Notebook, and before I do, I wanna make sure I'm in, um, in that directory where I just created lecture four, okay? So remember that that was under documents, and I can see documents right here when I ran ls. 
So I'm going to say CD documents. And I'm going to tab to complete that. From an LS again, lots of stuff here. I remember that I had put this in a folder or directory called CS301. So I'm going to say CD, CD CS301, run LS. Here I have my lecture four that I created before. So I'm going to say CD to lecture four and then run LS. And I see sure enough, here's my main.py file. Let me just do a PWD so you can see exactly where I am. Um, and of course, when you're doing on this on your Mac, uh, your username is maybe something other than TRH. Okay, so I'm here now and I'm going to say Jupyter uh, Notebook. And this will open up something in the browser for me. Um, depending on how your computer is set up, um, some people have to run this instead. They have to say Python dash M Jupyter uh, and then Notebook. So maybe try this if the other simpler command doesn't work. Uh, but for now, I'm just going to run Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook. And I see that um, file I had in that folder, uh, main.py. I'm going to create a new notebook file. So I click New and Python 3. Okay, and I'm going to rename it right away. I want to rename it main. All right, and this means that I'm going to, if I come back to here, this this tab, I see that that created a main.i uh, pi nb file. So I'm going to come back here and I'm going to run <coughs> the same example I've been doing before. I'm going to say 1 plus 2, 1 plus 1, enter 2 plus 2. And then I run that and I can do that by hitting shift enter. And you notice something a little bit funny here. Um, in this case, it only printed off that last value in that cell. It didn't print off two like I might have expected. If I want to get two different values, what I may have to do is put each value in its own cell. So I'll put one plus one in a cell and two plus two in a cell. Uh, now there's other things you could do. Uh, let's say I want to have three plus three and four plus four in the same cell. By default, only this last bit gets printed out but I can put a print just like I did in strip mode before. And if I run this, then I see I get six, which is a three plus three, and then eight that's automatically printed out. Now be a little bit careful here because you see that even though this was printed to the screen, only eight is part of this outbox. And when we're running, um, when we're running your code, looking for answers, we're just gonna be looking at that outbox, uh, not this part up here. So generally you want to do that, you want to just split each part up in its own cell. Okay, so there's lots of things we can do in here now. Now, now it's about to get um, interesting. Uh, I've already shown you the one plus one, right, where we can um, uh, do a simple operation. A lot of these other um, uh, operations are, are pretty similar. Like you might expect, maybe I can do one minus one. Uh, I get zero, no surprise there. Um, if I, if I come up here again, uh, notice that it doesn't matter how much space I have here. Uh, it won't care about that. One thing it will care about though is space at the beginning. If I run something like that, um, maybe sometimes I might hit some sort of error. It's not, not showing you right now, uh, but in general, Python is gonna be sensitive to having space at the beginning. It's not gonna care about space otherwise. Okay, so I did that. Let me try something different. So let me try one divided by one. And you see something a little bit different than before. You know, we have a decimal point here. Uh, before I had two, now I have uh, 1.0. So what's happening here? Um, it turns out that, uh, let's say I do something like one divided by two, I need a fundamentally different type of data. I need to be able to have these decimal points. Whereas if I'm, oh, whereas if I'm adding things, uh, if I add two integers together like this, then I know that I'm never going to have to have um, some sort of decimal points. So we're going to be learning about different um, types of data, and I'm going to show you very soon how to compare those. Well, let, let me show you another um, thing that you might see. Instead of 1 divided by 1, I'm going to do 1 divided by a million, shift enter. Um, this might be familiar to, to some of you. Um, this is scientific notation, that E stands for exponent, and I have negative uh, 6. What this means is that I'm going to move the decimal point uh, six places uh, to the left of, of where it appears to be, right? And this is useful if I have very small numbers, right? If I have very small numbers like that, um, or on the flip side, if I have very large numbers, sometimes it's easier to read uh, these numbers if they're in scientific uh, notation. Well, let me show you another thing that's a little bit funny here. <coughs> I'm going to divide 
1.0 by 100. I'm going to run that. Uh, that's exactly what you expect. Uh, you might start thinking, oh, I know what's going on here. I'm going to run 1.1 divided by 100, and run that. And now we see that it's approximately right, but there was some really weird rounding uh, that happened there. Uh, you're going to see this a lot when you're programming, and it's nothing to be worried about. Um, why is it doing this? Well, in computers, uh, internally, they're using zeros and ones to represent everything, and you don't need to know the specifics, but what that means is that for uh, when a computer rounds things, it might round it in ways that a human would not round. You know, usually we round um, to a power of 10, a computer is going to be rounding differently, and so when we print it off, you know, in decimal, right, base 10, that's going to look, look a little bit different than you might expect. <coughs> um, so we've already seen one way to multiply things. Um, there's other ways that you might be used to multiplying things that won't work. If I say something like this, 1 times 1, that's not going to work. I get something called a syntax error. Uh, if I do something like this, you know, this is a mathematical notation we've used a lot. Same thing, that's not going to work um, either. The only way we can multiply things is this one by one. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, different types of data. Remember that um, one looks fundamentally different than um, one divided by one, right? How can we figure out what's going on here? Um, we can do this thing. Let's say I have a value like one. In front of it, I can say type and then put that in parentheses. And if I run that, it'll tell me what type of data it is. Um, this is an integer. You might remember integers from high school. Integers include numbers like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2, so on and so forth. Uh, basically, basically anything positive or negative um, uh, that doesn't have any sort of decimal uh, associated with it. Whereas if I do something like this, type, and then here I want to say 1 divided by 1, <coughs> I see that there's a second type of data here, uh, which is the float. Right? So you're going to be using this type thing a lot when you don't know what's going on. You're going to use that to kind of peek at the data and see what's happening. So let me, let me try a couple more examples. Um, let's say I want to divide uh, 7 by 2. That works just fine. Um, so this is an example of a float. Sometimes what I'd like to do is, when I'm dividing an integer by an integer, I still want to get an integer as my result instead of doing something like this. And when I want to get an integer as my result, <coughs> what I'll do is I'll say, I'll have two slashes. I'll say 7, um, 2 slashes, 2, and then run that. And now you see it's just rounding down um, to that nearest value. Right? So 3.5, I just have uh, 3 left over there. And to show you the difference between these, right? here I have 3.5, here I have 3. <coughs> Let me come back and, and say type around both of these to show you the difference. I'm going to say type just like so. And run both of these. I get a float, and this time I get um, an integer. So float just uh, refers to the fact that that uh, decimal point can be floating. Okay. Um, in this case, right, when I did the 7 integer division by 2, you know, 3 doesn't go evenly into 7. Uh, there are some sort of remainder there. What is the remainder here? Uh, it's just 1. And we can get that in Python too. If I say 7, and then I have this percent sign, this percent sign is not what you think it is. Uh, this is basically saying, what is the remainder <coughs> when I divide uh, 7 by 2? If I run that, sure enough, the, the remainder is 1. If, for example, I said 8, 2, right? 8, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, if I said 8 divided by 2, right, that I get 4, and the remainder is 0, right? So now I get 0. What if I say 9 mod 2? So this is called the modulo operator. Sometimes people just say mod uh, for short. A 9 divided by 2 is 4, but I get a remainder of 1, right? So, you know, either you're going to be using the regular divide by, or you might often be using um, integer divide by with this modulo operator. We'll have some more practice with that later. Um, other operators you might see. Um, let, let me give you a little uh, bit of vocabulary here. So this, this is an operator. Uh, these two numbers it's acting on are operands. And uh, this is what we'll call a binary operator because it's operating on two operands. It's also possible to have uh, unary operators. And unary operators, as you might guess, are only operating on one of these. So in this case, I could say 
3 plus negative 4. And if I run that, well, I get exactly what you might expect. So this is a little bit funny, right? Let's say I do both of these. Uh, 3 minus negative 4, I get 7. You see that the same symbol can mean different things in different cases. This is what we might call a unary operator. It's operating on 4. And then this one is operating on negative 4 and 3. Uh, other operators that are kind of interesting. Um, let's say I say 3 and then this. Uh, this raises 3 to the power of 2. So 3 squared is just 9. Um, 3 cubed um, is 27. 3 to the fourth is going to be 81. So that'll come in handy. Uh, maybe before in other languages, if, if you have any prior programming background, you've seen a character like this. That's not going to work in Python. You're going to have to use these two um, exclamation uh, points. <clears throat> we can also use this, of course, to do things like um, if we want to get the square root of something, the square root just means raising something to the half power. Now that's going to give me 4. Um, if I want to get the, the inverse of something, I could take 2 to the negative 1. All right, I'm going to get um, 1 over 2, which is 0.5. Uh, this might all be very, uh, very much what you expect. So let me try something a little bit different. I'm going to say uh, negative 5 squared. And I want you to think a moment about what this is trying to do. Okay, you, you write it down, what you think it's trying to do, and then we're going to actually run it. Negative 25. Uh, this is countered a lot of people's expectations. And to understand what's going on here, we have to talk about something called operator uh, precedence. So I'm going to head back to the slides here uh, and, and go over this in more detail. So operator precedence. So the way Python works is that it simplifies things one by one. It applies one operator um, at a time. And there are rules about which operators it does in what order. And the rules are first do work within parentheses. So I have an expression here. And the first thing it's trying to do is see that 1 divided by 2 is in parentheses. So it'll simplify that to 0.5. Next, it's trying to do higher precedence operators first. Uh, what's higher precedence? Uh, you just have to remember that. We're going to list on, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a list of all the operators, and you're going to have to remember, well, maybe multiplication becomes for, before addition, and then there's a bunch of other ones that you're going to have to remember as well this semester. Okay, so the next thing it's going to do is it's going to do this power, right? We raise 16 to the power of uh, 0.5. That's higher precedence than multiplication or addition. So I'm going to get the square root of 16, which is 4. Now, uh, after um, power, multiplication is the next highest precedence. And since there's two multiplications, those tie, which means it's going to go to left to right. So it's going to reduce 9, uh, uh, 3 times 3 to 9. And then it'll reduce 2 times 2 to 4. And now we're just trying to do the additions left to right. again. that's how we break ties. So 9 plus 4 is 13. 13 plus 4 uh, is 17. So even though we might have big complicated expressions with a lot of uh, operators and operands in them, uh, Python uh, is, is very regimented and will do exactly one step at each time. And I think it makes sense for you as a new programmer to do this as well. This probably seems like a simple example that you could have done much more quickly on your own because it's all mathematical. But when we're seeing new logical operators that you've never seen before, I just encourage you to go one step at a time and be very methodical. Okay, so I, I said that there's this notion of some operators being higher precedence for others. And uh, for example, um, we do exponents first. That's the most important operator. Um, then we do these signs, these unary operators. We either get positive or negative values. Then we do everything related to multiplying and dividing, subtraction, comparison. And then there are these other Boolean operators I'm going to be talking about later uh, today. Now, you probably have a good intuition for most of the mathematical ones. Um, what I want to just talk about now is trying to break these into three broad categories. Um, we're going to do mathematical operators first. Uh, we're going to do logical operators, which I'll talk about later, last. And then we do comparison operators uh, in the middle. So if you remember this, I think this will get you pretty far to remembering uh, that total order from uh, simplifying first until simplifying last. Uh, now, you can see in the logical section that some of these are more important than others. They can be hard to remember. If you don't remember it in your programming, uh, the simple solution, uh, you could look it up, but the simpler solution is just to add parentheses 
uh, because remember that rule, right? We do things inside parentheses uh, first, and then this operator precedent stuff is kind of a second rule um, if parentheses don't tell us what we should be doing first. Okay, so let, let's head back to the terminal and talk about what happened here. Um, oh, excuse me, not the terminal. I want to head back to Jupyter Notebooks. So in this case, uh, you see I have two operators here. I have uh, this power operator, and then I also have this unary operator that does negation. And coming back to the slides, we see that exponents are slightly higher precedence than this unary. So what that means is it's doing this before the negative. So we should really think about the code like this. That's what hap what's happening, and that's why we get 25 and then negative 25. Now, of course, let's say I actually wanted to square negative, 20, negative 5, then I would have just put parentheses around that and run that like so, and dot in 25. Okay, so we've seen two types of data so far. We've seen integers and floats, and those should both absolutely be in your notes. Now I'm going to show you another type of data called a string. A string is just text. Okay, so let's say I wanted to have some text. I want to say hello world, and I'm going to try running this. That's not going to work because uh, Python thinks this is some sort of Python code, and these are not valid uh, uh, statements in Python. If I want to have a, a string containing text, I'm going to have to put in quotes in Python. So I'm going to run this, and you see that it just prints it out for me. Again, whatever I typed in, it's just going to print that um, out. What's the type of this data? Let, let's take a look. I'm going to say, what is the type of hello world, and run that. And I see, sure enough, it's a string abbreviated as uh, str. Okay, now one of the things you might be wondering about is when I typed it with double quotes, why did it end up putting it with um, these single quotes? So let me let me try typing this in, in single quotes right here. And you see it then again, I get single quotes. It turns out that this with single quotes and double quotes mean exactly the same thing. Uh, Python doesn't care. You as a programmer can just type whatever you prefer to type, and maybe sometimes you'll prefer one and the other. Um, you can see in both cases, Python is printing it um, the same way. <clears throat> um, why might you want to choose one over the other? Uh, well, for example, let's say I want to do something uh, like this. Let's say I want to say, um, I'm going to have a string, and I'm going to say, uh, she said, and I want to put quotes there, uh, she said hello. I'm going to try running that and Python's unhappy. Why is it unhappy? Because, you know, these are the quotes showing where my string is, and I wanted to put this inside of it, but instead of viewing this as being inside the whole string, Python thought that this was ending this right here. Um, in contrast, if I want to use these single, quote, single quotes, like so, then it works just fine, right? It knows that this is not the end of a string, because I'm using this to actually identify my whole whole string. Okay, now it turns out that we can also, before we were doing things like one plus one, we can also use this same addition operator on strings. And when we, we do that, string can concatenate them together. For example, I could say, hello, uh, Ada Lovelace, and I run that, and I see it prints off that whole thing. Now, of course, maybe I want some spaces in there. I could, I could do that multiple ways. I could add a space here like that, or maybe I could even uh, add that as a separate, separate string, right, to get the message I actually want in the end. Okay, so addition works on strings. <coughs> maybe not surprisingly, a multiplication doesn't work. What if I want to say x times y? I run that, and what it says here is type error can't multiply sequence by non-int of type stir. Okay, so one of the things you should do when you're learning a new programming language like we are this semester is try lot, running lots of different things, see what happens, pay attention to the errors that you see, um, and maybe even make notes of that so that when you see these errors later when you're doing real programming, you're gonna be able to think, oh, what kinds of things cause that error? Okay, so that doesn't work, um, not surprisingly. Let me, let me try something else. I'm gonna try um, uh, let me try uh, this string times 20. <coughs> I'm going to run that. And now we actually see it does do something. Um, I can't multiply a string by a string, 
but I can multiply a string uh, by an integer, and what it does is it just repeats it a bunch of times. Um, if I wanted to, I could go crazy, right? I'll say, uh, let's print that off a thousand times, and I get this big, long, um, crazy message. Uh, Python's laughing like a maniac here. Okay, so we can do that. <coughs> Another tricky thing that we can do um, is uh, we do something called escaping. Okay, so, so remember before I, I had this message, uh, she said hello, and that didn't work, right? One of the solutions was indeed to use single quotes here instead, uh, but what if I need to have both single quotes and double quotes inside of here? Um, I start running out of uh, possibilities. In that case, I need to somehow tell Python that this is a special quote, it's not the end. And the way I do that is I do something called escaping. Escaping is very simple, it just means I put a backslash in front of the character that I want inside of my string. So I can run that just like so, and I say she said hello, or it's just fine. Um, other things you might see, uh, like this, I might say A, I'm gonna do backslash T, and then B, and run that. And at first that looks the same, but if I do something like this, if I actually print that and run that, I see that there's a big space here in the middle. And so what is that space? Uh, backslash T um, is basically means, let's put a tab here. It's a way of putting a tab um, in a string. I could also, if I wanted to, put a backslash N on that. Backslash N says put in a new line. After N, I want a new line character before my B. Okay, so you're gonna see that a lot. Sometimes you're gonna escape special characters. Um, you might use slash backslash N, backslash T. Why, why does it do something different when I do this? versus doing something like this? The answer is that when I just put a string here like this, uh, Python is trying to put it um, in the form that a programmer might want to see, right? All programmers know what backslash n means, and this is convenient for them. When you actually say I want to print it, then it's trying to show that new line character there, because now Python is assuming uh, maybe somebody is using this code who's not an actual programmer. They didn't write the code, but they're using the program. And in that case, it wants to actually put it in a way that's a little bit more user-friendly. So you might see those differences there, but of course it's the same, same string. All right, so let me, let me head along here. Uh, great. So... Let me show you another kind of operator now. Uh, maybe this might seem a little bit familiar. I'm gonna say five greater than three and run that. And that says true, all right, we know that's true. Uh, but what kind of thing is true? What kind of type is that? I'm gonna try that right here. I'm gonna say type of five greater than three. And I see it's this thing uh, called a Boolean. Okay, so that's a little bit strange. Right, I may have some slides later to tell you a little bit about what Booleans are. Actually, maybe we'll just look at those slides right now. I'm gonna head over to the slides again. And we are right here. <clears throat> so what is a Boolean? Um, a Boolean is named after this guy, George Bool, here, um, who, the, a very angry looking fellow on the right of the slide. And he said, kind of had this notion that we can think about logic in terms of these two values, true and false and uh, just three operators on those values, and, or, and not. And surprisingly, this is like a pretty simple system, but there's lots of interesting things you can do with it. So let me quickly go over the exact rules for how and, or, and not behave on true and false. So here on the, on the left, I have something called a truth table. And you see there's two rows and columns. And those rows and columns correspond to two values, two Boolean values. So remember that each Boolean value can either be false or true, and I have two of them. And what this first table is showing me is what happens when I and two values together. Um, to be very specific, let's say I, I have this statement. Uh, it's a Saturday, and we're in CS301. Uh, it's not a Saturday, that's false. Uh, we're in CS301, that's true. So I basically said something that's false and true. So I look that off. First I, I go in the false row and then the true column and I see that the result is, is false. Um, when I and things together like that, 
even if part of it is true, the whole thing becomes false if any one part of it is false, right? The it's Saturday part is false, making the whole thing false. Okay, let's look at another one. Uh, project one is due today. Let's say today is Wednesday. Or I'll eat my hat, right? I have a little party hat there. Uh, in this case, uh, project one to do is due today. That's actually true. Um, I'll eat my hat. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to eat my hat under any circumstances, so that's just plain false. So I look those up, true or false. Uh, this whole thing is true, even though part of it was false. When I or things together, it only takes one thing to make everything true. Uh, and then finally, not, not is pretty simple, right? If I have something uh, that's true, and then I say not that, then I get false and vice versa. Okay, so let's let's come back and we're gonna um, look at some more things uh, like this. Let me head back to my uh, document. So what's interesting here, right, is I did this comparison, which is true of Boolean. And so this is a, one of the ways we're often trying to get um, uh, kind of these Boolean expressions into the system, right? And the other examples I was doing, I was just making statements that were true or false. Like it's a Saturday, uh, project one is due today. Um, here, uh, the statements we're often making are in terms of these comparisons. I think that five is greater than three. Right? So I can run other things. I could say like negative three is greater than negative five. Um, this is actually true too. Negative three is a larger number than negative five. I can also compare uh, strings. So A is less than B. <clears throat> That's true. Uh, why is that? Well, in general, letters that come sooner in the alphabet are less than letters that come later in the alphabet. Now there's one weird thing about that rule, and, and that's that it only works for letters of the same case, right? So this will work for um, lower case letters too, just like that. But uh, if I do something like this, if I say A is less than B, I actually get something that's false. Um, in Python's opinion, um, all the lowercase letters are greater than all the uppercase letters. You know, there's lots of little gotchas like this. You're just gonna get used to them as you write more code. So in addition to this less than, there's other variants. I can say uh, three less than or equal to four, right? Um, and what this means is that even if I say four less than or equal to four, um, that will still be true, right? So this is true, whereas four less than four is not true, right? So I can get one larger if I'm using this less than or equal to. If I say less five, less than or equal to four, of course that's false. Um, other things I can do is I can compare two things. And you might think from your mathematical experience, I may write something like that. Uh, but it turns out in Python that this means something else. This is not a comparison operator. So I actually have to put two of these. And then I can actually say is one equal to two. If I try to say something like this, one equals two, um, I get this error, can't, can't assign to a literal. This is another example, right? Put this down in your notes. Uh, if I get this sort of thing, can't assign to a literal, uh, it might mean that you were using one equal sign instead of the two equal signs that you needed. Okay, so I'm gonna get rid of that. Um, let's say, so this was false, that one uh, equals two. I can also, if I want to, say one not equal to two and run that. And in that case, I actually do have something that's true, right? One is not the same as two. I just say exclamation mark and then equal. Um, I could say two equal to two. That's of course true. Uh, let's talk about types a little bit, right? So here's something that's a little bit funny. So let me do this last example again, but in this case, I'm gonna have a two equal to 2.0. And whenever I have one of these kind of weird examples, I want you to write down a prediction. What do you think will happen? Uh, because if you have make a prediction, there's a chance you'll be surprised. And whenever you're surprised, that really engages your brain and you remember things. So have an opinion. Is this going to be true or false? And let me run it. Okay, it turns out it's true, right? It doesn't matter that uh, 2 is an integer and 2.0 is a float. Those two values can still be the same as each other. Well, so let's try this. So I already, I already said that this is true. Uh, let me look at this. Is the type of 2 the same as the type of 2.0? Do you have an opinion about whether this will work? You try it. Okay, that's false, right? So 
what's interesting here is you see that I have two values that in some way are a little bit different, but they can indeed still be equal uh, to each other. So that's something you're going to have to get used to. Okay, so um, I already showed that the type of, of true is a Boolean. If I write something false, that's also going to be a Boolean. Uh, and I can do this directly, right? I could directly say the type of true or the type of false. In both cases, it'll say bool, which is short for Boolean. Okay, so let me um, draw into some more examples now, right? I, I've kind of have been dealing with a bunch of Booleans, but I haven't been combining them using those logical operators that I talked about uh, in the slide, right? So let's say I have false. I can say not false, and that will give me true. Not false is true. In the same way, not true is going to be false. Okay, I can also do combinations. If I say true or false, right? Remember, uh, you know, I'm saying something like, uh, it's Wednesday or I'll eat my hat, right? Something true or false, that makes the whole thing true. And the order of these things doesn't matter. Uh, false or true is the same as true or false. Okay, and, and remember, right, I can uh, get to this false and true in any way. I could say one is greater than two, that's false. Or uh, I could say one is, one is less than two, which is true. Right, so I'm gonna get the same thing that way. Um, to be a good programmer, you have to be able to kind of fluidly go between things like this in your head, think about what these values are, and then kind of mentally translate to this, and then know uh, what the result will be. Um, other interesting examples, um, I can say, let's say I say uh, not true or true, and I run that. In this case, I have false or true, why do I have that? That because not is higher precedence than or, so this becomes false before this. If I instead do something like this, not, and I put all that all in parentheses, true or true, then what's gonna happen is this is going to run first. That will be true, that I'm not gonna be true, and I'm gonna get false. So you have to be a little careful here, right? Think about where uh, your parentheses are implicitly going as you do this. Oh, let me let me kind of give another example. I can have big long combinations, right? I can say uh, one equals one, and two equals two, and three uh, equals three, and let's say four equals five. Is this going to be true or false? Well, I have a lot of true things in here, a lot of true things. But when I add them all together in this way, one thing that's false makes the whole thing false. <clears throat> and in the same way, if I have a bunch of false things, so I'll say 0 equals 1, or a 0 equals 2, or 0 equals 3, or 0 equals 4, or let's, I can have lots of false things. All of these things are false, so if I run it, the, the final answer will be false. But if I just change one of these things to be true, Right, maybe I'll make this one to be true here. One plus two is equal to three. One true thing can make the whole thing thing true. Okay, let's do something else tricky. So true, as you might guess, is not equal to false. Right, that's no surprise. True is equal to itself. What about this one? Let's say I say true equals true. Okay, in different programming languages, maybe you'll see different things, but in Python, uh, this is false. Right, so this might be a little funny, right, because before you saw that uh, one equals one, right, it, here I have two different types that feel the same, and they are, in fact, equal to each other. Here I have two uh, different values that feel like different types of the same value, uh, but indeed they're not equal to each other. Um, some weird things you might see is I might say true equals um, one. It turns out that one is another way of expressing true, uh, and in the same way false equals zero. Uh, but it's not true that uh, two equals other numbers, right? So true can only equal one. So examples like this, uh, sometimes we're going to call these things truthy or falsy, right? They're basically equivalent to true, 
uh, but they're not an actual uh, Boolean. Okay, so that was um, uh, all of the examples I did uh, uh, wanted to go through uh, today in um, the notebook. I encourage you to go through um, the rest of these examples and pages um, on sorry, not in pages, but in, in the worksheet that I posted online on your own and practice those. And the way you test these, right, let's say I want to see what um, this value is, zero, and then remember this is module three. I could copy these things out of my document and then I could go back to my notebook and paste that and then run it. Right, so the idea of these, notebook, of these worksheets is that we're gonna give you lots of things you can test yourself. And the hope is that as you're testing the things we ask you to test, you're going to think of other things to try as well at the same time.